Well, we're so glad that you're here with us at Avalon Church today, and thank you for joining us online as well. Uh, today is going to be the day that we take our annual miracle offering. If you're not new to, if you're new to Avalon Church, you may not know what that is, but this has been a tradition in our church for many years now. And it's basically the time of year that's close to Christmas that we bring a gift that will be a gift of thanksgiving, a gift of thankfulness to the Lord. Um, and it is a time that we focus on what is most important, that we by faith invest in the kingdom of God, invest in what God is doing to reach people here at Avalon Church. And um, it's, a, it's a time that we, uh, the reason we call it a miracle offering is because we encourage you to pray that God would do something that only God can do in your life. For example, uh, the Bible teaches us that we should pray about everything, but the miracle offering is not time to pray for a parking space. Do you get me? I mean, that's important. I mean, you pray about everything, okay? But maybe you pray more than God help my hair to look good this week when I go to work. The prayer should be something that only God can do. And that might be the salvation of a spouse or of a child or of a coworker or a family member or a friend. That might be that you've been trying to have a child and you've not been able to and you say, God, please, would you do this for us? Uh, maybe it's something about you're starting a business and you need God to, to give you direction and to give you wisdom and to help you uh, in the decisions that you make. A miracle is something that only God can do, something that God, who knows more, sees more than we do will direct us in. And so that's what we do at the Miracle Offering. And uh, this is, of course, a time that we want to uh, dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to God. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the theme of our Miracle Offering. You got those cards a few weeks ago. And the theme this year was above all. Now, what does that mean? We want to put Jesus above all in everything in our life. And the text we're going to read today uh, shows us how that we put Christ above all, above everything in our life. Now, the way that we do this, according to this text, is a very interesting thing because it's particularly the first point that I'm going to give you. It's something that you would not think was putting God first in your life. It's something that you would not think that would put the kingdom of God first in your life. I'm going to explain what that is in just a moment. But again, reading with me in Luke chapter 12 and verse number 22. You can follow along online. You can follow along on your smartphone. Or if you have a, an old-fashioned Bible like I do, um, then uh, you can follow along that way as well. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. And he said, this is Jesus speaking. He said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, let me just pause for a second. How many have ever been anxious about your health? That's your body. How many have ever been anxious about maybe something that you needed? Maybe you needed clothes or you wanted new clothes, or, but there was some particular physical need. Maybe it was a house. Maybe you're trying to sell your house. Maybe you're trying to get into a house. How many have ever had a worry about something like that? How many have ever worried about your job? Maybe you thought maybe you weren't going to have a job after all that's been going on. Here's what Jesus said. He said, don't be anxious about these things. Now, does that mean that we should not get an education or prepare? No, that's not what that means at all. He's saying, don't worry, trust me. That's what he's saying. He says, for life is more than food. Somebody needs to inform Chick-fil-A of that. Um, life is more than food. It is, but it ain't much more than banana pudding. I'm just going to say that out out loud. My grandma's cooking. Anybody with me on that? No, I'm teasing, of course. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? We can't. You can't. It doesn't matter how rich you are. You can be the world's wealthiest person. and You can't add a single hour to your life. Not a single hour. 
God says, why do we worry about things we have no control over? He said, if you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why would you be anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, this is getting down to the brass tacks of this. Because worry is the opposite of faith. So when I am worrying about things that I have no control over or things that don't matter most, what am I doing? I'm exercising little faith. I'm not really exercising my faith at all. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried for all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your father knows. Let me just pause right there. Your father knows. Aren't you glad that God knows? He knows everything. He knows more than we do. He knows, knows the future. He, for the Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom. I'm going to define what that is for you. Seek His kingdom and these things. What things? Food, clothing, shelter, job, health. All these things that we worry about so much in life that we spend so much of our time obsessing over, that we spend so much of our time working for, all of these things will be added to you. Now, understand what he's saying here. If you seek God first, if you seek the kingdom of God specifically first, then everything you need is going to be added to you. All right, so do we get that? This is the words, these are the words of Jesus. And if I'm going to trust, I trust all the words of the Bible, I believe they're inspired by God, but if I'm going to trust any of the words, it's especially going to be the words that Jesus says, okay? He said that everything that I need will be taken care of as long as I seek him first, specifically if I seek the kingdom of God first. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, this is interesting. He says, I'm to seek the kingdom of God and it's God's good pleasure to give it to me. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew? He said, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God wants to satisfy you with the things that are most important in life. God wants to satisfy your needs, not necessarily your greeds, but he wants to satisfy you about the things that are most important in your life, the things that you need most. God knows what we need. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, I told you I was going to define what the kingdom of God is, but I want you to understand the explicit command here is that we seek the kingdom of God above all, above everything in our life. We're to seek the kingdom of God. And he said that when I seek it, God most definitely will give me that. He most definitely in his pleasure, it brings him great joy when I seek him, when I seek the kingdom of heaven to give it to me. Now, the question then becomes, what is the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus talked about it, and in fact, it was central to everything he taught. God's kingdom is first. It means it's the priority. It means that we must pursue it wholeheartedly. So technically, the kingdom of God is the fact that God is sovereign in every area of life. That's technically, if you want to give a technical definition. But a practical definition for us is that uh, after the resurrection of Jesus... He said, he said these words, all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. So all of it. And so technically, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Jesus. Um, his death and resurrection fulfilled what God had promised, which was that God was going to give us an eternal king on an eternal throne. I want you to hear me. An eternal king on an eternal throne. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. 
All right. So when God says that we're to seek the kingdom of God, it is that we're to seek the kingdom where Jesus now reigns. In other words, we're to seek his authority, his being first in our life, in every area of our life. To seek the kingdom of God, technically, if you boil it, I mean, simply put, if you boil it down, it means to seek King Jesus. That's what it means. And the Bible is clear that the kingdom of God includes the church. Uh, the church will go into eternity and last forever. Not local churches, Avalon Church, uh, this group of people will, that are Christians and believers, will live forever, okay, uh, in heaven with God. But this physical location is not going to last forever. Uh, this local gathering is not going to last forever. Do you know why that is? Because everybody in this room, if God tarries his coming, if we live long enough, we're going to die. And one day, I'm not going to be the pastor of this church anymore. Uh, not necessarily by choice, but by death. I'm not going to live in this old body forever. However, I will have a resurrected body, and I will live with God forever in heaven. So to seek God's kingdom is simply to recognize Jesus as king and Lord, and first in everything. So when I am seeking the kingdom of God, what it means is that I am seeking to put Jesus first in every area of my life. Now, don't get me wrong, while the church is a part of the kingdom of God, if you're just coming to church on Sunday, that's not what it means to seek the kingdom of God. Now, that's important. You should do that. I'm glad you're here. But seeking the kingdom of God means that you put him first in every area of your life, that he has the authority in every area of your life. You can seek the kingdom of God by seeking to put Jesus at the center of your marriage. You know what happens oftentimes to us is we become selfish in our relationships and we manipulate people and we want it all to be about us. But when you put Jesus first in your marriage, you're seeking the kingdom of God. Uh, when you put Jesus first in your job, you're seeking the kingdom of God. When you put Jesus first in your possessions, you're seeking the kingdom of God. When you put Jesus first in your purpose in life, and I find this to be interesting because we all want a purpose, we all need a purpose, and yet the, so, the most obvious purpose to us is the one that will last forever. If I know, if I'm aware of the fact that this life is going to last a short period of time, relatively speaking. Now, if you live to be 100 years old, I read about a woman that was a professor uh, at the University of North Carolina. I'm a big North Carolina Target fan. Her first name was Hortense. I've never heard that name before, Hortense. She is 103 years old, and they just named a building after her. Now, I would imagine, I think she's a believer, I think she's a Christian, I would imagine if you were to ask Hortense, does it seem like you've lived for 103 years? Does it seem like life has been long? I promise you what she would say is it just seems like yesterday that I was doing this and this. It just seems like yesterday. And I know that for all of us, when it comes down to our life, our time, it goes by so quickly. And yet we know we're aware of that after this life is when it's going to last forever. And what if I lived up to 103 years old like Hortense, this former professor at the University of North Carolina? What if I lived to be 103 years old and I died and I made no investment in eternity? I cared not about the kingdom of God. I was worried not about what was going to be the longest part of my life, which is in eternity. What if all I did was live for the now? The very things that Jesus said, don't worry about. House, job, car, bank account. Now, these are important things. Don't get me wrong. But in comparison to the most important things, they're not important at all. In comparison to the most important things, your life that you will live after you die is far more important than the life that you will live here on this earth. And so seeking the kingdom of God means that I put him first in my purpose. 
It also means, and this is going to sting a little bit for some, it means that we put him first in our politics. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting you should be uh, a political person. The Bible does teach that this world is not our home, that we are citizens of heaven. But don't, don't, mis, don't misunderstand what the Bible teaches about government. The Bible says that God ordains government. And you might get frustrated at ours, uh, but I have been to 22 different countries in the world, and as frustrated as I get with ours, I've yet to find one that's better, okay? But I want you to hear what I'm saying. Jesus, now he calls, do I believe he calls Christians into politics? Absolutely. And I believe that you should live out your convictions, and maybe there'll be in this room somebody that'll be the governor of Georgia one day. I'll vote for you, all right? Uh, maybe you'll be the president of the United States, one day. That'd be awesome. You invite me to the White House, all right? But the fact is, that's not the most important thing. You know what's more important than that? The kingdom of heaven. The fact that Jesus is king, that he reigns, not will reign, he reigns now. I know it doesn't look like it sometimes, but just trust me, he is in charge. And so when I'm recognizing Jesus as Lord first in all of my life, then I can relax and I don't have to worry over politics. And I don't have to stress out over the news. I've got where I don't watch it very much because it makes me angry mostly. And um, I'm like, how could they be that stupid? You know, and I don't need to live my life that way. And so uh, I know the bare minimum. But I like the lyrics to the old song that says, if you want to be one who seeks the kingdom of God, I like the lyrics of this song. It says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Well, that's kind of an old country folksy kind of song. But I believe it contains a great truth that your citizenship, while technically you are an American citizen because you live here, maybe you were born here, your citizenship is in heaven. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, this world is not our home. The most important thing then is for me to seek the kingdom of God. Now, I want to show you from this text three ways that you seek the kingdom of God. And as I told you, the first one's going to be odd sounding because it doesn't make sense. The first way that you seek the kingdom of God is you don't worry. Now, doesn't that sound countercultural? Doesn't sound, that sounds kind of strange. I mean, if I'm thinking about the things that are the most important in life, if I'm seeking God at the center of my life, if I'm seeking King Jesus in all the priorities of my life, the very first thing I think about is not that I shouldn't worry. That's not the first thing I think about. I'm thinking maybe I go to church or maybe I give some money or maybe I serve or maybe I become a missionary. But God, in fact, Jesus said this. He said, don't worry. And that's interesting because worry is an earthly mindset, not a kingdom mindset. Worry comes from when I focus on the wrong source. When I was a little boy, I didn't worry about anybody beating me up because I always said, my dad can beat up your dad. Or my dad uh, can beat up, you know, you or whatever. You know, one little boy told me, I, I said, my dad can beat up your dad. He said, that's no big deal. My mom can beat up my dad. <laughs> but here's what I want you to understand. Worry is an earthly mindset because when I was a little boy, I didn't worry because I trusted in my dad. He was bigger, stronger. I thought he was the hero. You know, I'm talking about as a little boy. As you get older, you find out that you, your parents are human too. But when I was little, I had such confidence. And I, you know what? I never worried. You know what I never worried about when I was four years old? I never worried one time about paying a mortgage. I just never did. I never worried one time about opening the refrigerator and finding food in there. Not once. I, I never worried about whether or not my parents were going to be able to have a car. 
I did not worry about my dad's job. I never worried about any of those things. You know why? Because the source of my confidence was in someone that was so much bigger than me, so much greater than I was, I trusted in my parents. And therefore, I didn't worry. It was only as I got older and more independent of my parents that I began to worry. Now, listen to me. If you worry, it's because as the older you've gotten as a Christian or the longer you've lived as a Christian, the more independent you have become from your heavenly father. You say, well, I, I'm just a worrier by nature. I know some of you worry if you don't have anything to worry about. But listen, the further you get into worry, the further you get from a close kingdom relationship with your heavenly father. And so he says, don't worry. Don't worry about the basics, food, shelter, clothing, and love. Jesus said, if you want to have some confidence built up, just look at creation. Look at nature, the flowers, the grass, the birds. He said, don't worry about life because your heavenly father knows your need. He knows more than you. And, and I say this, it's close to Christmas time. When I was about 12 years old, well, I was 12, um, a couple days before Christmas, our house burned. All of our Christmas presents, all of our clothes, we were at church. Um, we'd gone over to my grandmother's house after church, and we got a phone call, and they t- said to my dad, come quick, your house is on fire. And I'll never forget as we sped over to our house and we were there in the driveway and the fire trucks were there and they were putting out the fire, chopped a hole in the roof. And I'll never forget my dad standing there and a strange look of peace came over his face. He says, kids, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'll never forget how much that impacted my faith as a 12-year-old boy. But you know what looked like a curse, God meant for a blessing? My dad had just recently gone into the ministry. In fact, they only been about a year in the ministry. And they were struggling somewhat financially. And uh, this ended up being one of the greatest financial blessings in our life. The insurance adjuster came out. He wrote the house off as a total loss. He said, there's no way any of this can be saved. And he, I guess it was a little different back in those days than it is now, uh, but he gave a check for everything to be replaced. And there was a man in our church, who's a contractor, uh, that my parents hired. And he said, before I tear this down, can I just do a little investigation? And he went into the house and he began to strip away the paneling and the sheetrock and all the stuff from the damage of the water. And he discovered that not a single stud had been burned in that house. What ended up being declared a total loss, not only completely paid for a complete new remodel of the house and gave our parents uh, some upgrades in the house, it put a large amount of money in the bank for them. And what was looking like it would be a curse ended up being a blessing. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because... Jesus said, your father knows your needs. You don't have to worry. And and I just want you to know, you don't have to worry about life. You don't have to worry about significance because Jesus promised that when we trust him, when we seek him, that everything's going to be okay. So why do you not have to worry? Why does Jesus say not worry? Let me give you, and I'll, I'll say this quickly. Number one, because God knows our needs. He's all knowing. He knows what you need. So don't worry because God loves us. God, if he loves the birds of the air, he's going to take care of you. I don't have to worry because God provides all that we need. And I could tell you story after story after story after story about that in my own life. And then you don't worry because worry is pointless. It's a total waste of energy. Jesus said, which one of you can just by worrying add a single hour to the span of your life. If you can't do that, why do you worry about the rest? That's what Jesus asked. So worry is pointless. And then worry weakens our faith. And I think this is the point that Jesus was making. 
If you want to seek the kingdom of God and you want to seek the authority of God, the rule of Jesus in your life, stop worrying. Stop worrying. I realize that's easier said than done, but you know the way that you do that? Just like the illustration I gave earlier, when you focus on someone who's bigger than you and stronger than you and knows more than you and can provide everything you need, just like I was a little boy, I never worried about the mortgage. I never worried about money. I never worried about food. You know why? Because I knew that my mom and daddy were going to take care of me. And in the same way, you and I do not have to worry because our heavenly father is going to take care of us. Worry weakens your faith. And then worry, the last thing is worry harms you. Did you know that worry literally physically harms you? It can cause your blood pressure to go up. It can cause mental health issues. It can cause stress in your life. It can cause you to make poor decisions in your life. Worry harms us. And so the first thing that Jesus said, you want to seek the kingdom of God. You want to seek King Jesus at the center of your life. Don't worry. Sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? But this passage emphasizes the eternal over the temporary. Jesus meets our deepest needs when we seek him first. Here's the second thing he said. If you're going to seek the kingdom of God, number two, you got to prioritize the eternal. It doesn't mean that you don't take care of your job. It doesn't mean that you don't get your education. It doesn't mean that you don't plan. It doesn't mean that you don't work hard. It doesn't mean that you don't manage your money. He did not teach here that we were not to think about these things in life. The Bible is filled with, for example, uh, commands, if you will, about how we handle money. It talks about planning, spending it well, saving, having contentment in your life. So the Bible doesn't mean that we don't think about these things. It means that we put Jesus first in these things in our life. Prioritize the eternal. How do you do that? I think, first of all, you do it with your time. Now, you're going to have to... This is funny. Um, A few years ago, a a person that got saved at our church, uh, they were really trying to seek God. And uh, they were really trying to put God first. And they were taking this very seriously. And I'll never forget, this man came up to me and he asked, how many hours a week should he spend up here during the week at church for God to be first place in his life? And I'm like, well, I think you're missing the point. The point is not that you spend time at this physical location. The point is that you prioritize your relationship with God in every area of your life with your time. Now, if you're going to prioritize God in your time, does that mean that you have to spend more hours reading the Bible than you do working? No. Because you know why I know that's not the case? Because the, Jesus, the audience that Jesus was speaking to, most of them probably couldn't read. And almost none of them had access to a copy of Scripture. So I know he was not putting that down as a requirement. But the point is this. It's how you prioritize your time. Doesn't mean you don't work. Doesn't mean that you don't go on vacation. It doesn't mean that you don't, um, you know, do wise things with your time. You might want to rethink how much time you spend on Facebook or social media or watching Netflix. You might want to rethink that. You might want to ask yourself that question. Am I making the best use of my time? But the fact is, if I'm going to please God, if I'm going to put Jesus first, I've got to prioritize my time. Let me show you how the Bible teaches us to prioritize things. And in fact, it says when we do this, that we are dedicating the entire lot to God. Uh, The tithe. You know, in the Old Testament times, a tithe simply means a tenth, and it's the first tenth. Whenever a person would say that they wanted to give everything in their life to God, you know what they would do? They would give a tithe because it represented their time, their earnings, um, all of this, their efforts, their talents, And this was not just true in giving, it was true in every part of culture. So in other words, if a dictator would come in and overthrow this country, he would demand a 10% tithe. And what that was saying was that he owned everything, okay? And so, do you know how I prioritize Jesus in my life like that? 
It's the principle of firsts. Now, you want to know how to put God first in your time? Give him the first part of your day. It doesn't have to be two hours. Just get up and pray and read the Bible or have it read to you off the Bible app. Now, I do realize that some people are not good in the morning. For some of you, if you started your day by praying, all you're doing is getting out of bed and sleeping on your knees. All right, I, I understand that, okay? But the point is this. You want to put God first in your time? Prioritize a time that you give to him. That, in essence, is saying, God, you have it all, okay? You prioritize your time. You prioritize your possessions. You give him first place in your work. And a lot of people forget this. You give him first place in your pleasures. Now, there are people that believe falsely that if you're going to be a Christian, you can't enjoy anything. You can never have any fun. And that just simply isn't true. God just wants you to know that there are some things that while they may be fun to begin with, in the end, all they bring is pain. And God doesn't want you to do those things. What he wants you to do is to enjoy pleasure through worship. Did you know that you can please God by watching a sunset on a beach? As long as you have that relationship with God and you're prioritizing that, that is a pleasure that God gives to you. That's not from the devil. That's from the Lord. I, and I believe this, and some of you may disagree with me. I believe that you can uh, uh, truly bring pleasure to God enjoying a glass of wine at the end of the day. I didn't say be an alcoholic. I didn't say pound a fifth of Jack Daniels, okay? And I didn't say do body shots down at the local bar for you young people. I, that's not what I said. You know that the Bible says in Psalms that, um, that, God, uh, that, that wine pleases God and man? You know why that is? It's because that when you drink a glass of wine, say for example, uh, and you are relaxing and worshiping God and thanking him for what he's doing, it enables you to worship God and to bring pleasure to him. Did you know that you can worship God with your sex life? Some of you are like, some of you guys are like, let's go home and worship, honey. All right. That's what the pastor said. No, I'm serious. When you put God first and prioritize him in your life, the meaningful things in your life become far more meaningful when you worship God. When you put him first in your money, it becomes far more meaningful. When you put him first in your job, it becomes far more meaningful. When you put him first in your pleasures, it becomes far more meaningful in your life. And then finally, the last thing he says, you want to put God first? You want to seek the kingdom? Live generously. That's what he says, live generously. Now he says, sell your possessions. Obviously, he didn't mean sell all your possessions. Otherwise, you would become a burden to society. So he's not suggesting that you should be poor. That was not what he was saying. He was saying you need to stop holding on to these things so tightly, and you need to please God and put him first. So what he's talking about is being generous, helping the needy. That's compassion for others. I'm so proud of how this church does that every year when we have uh, hope for Christmas. You help people that need it. You don't think of yourself only. That pleases God. That puts him first. Uh, living with an open hand. Can I just say this about your life financially? God did not design you to be a pipe. Or I'm sorry, he did not design you to be a pool where the water never escapes. He designed you to be a pipe where the water flows through. And when it comes to your finances, God did not decide for you to be a pool. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have a savings account. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have a retirement account. But if you think that that's all where it ends, then you know what's going to happen? You're going to get real stale and it's not going to be very healthy for you. Uh, in fact, eventually it'll turn to poison. And there are a lot of people that they allow their finances to turn their life poisonous poisonous but God says when you live as a pipe rather than a pool you're living generously and man there is no there is no limit to what God can do by the way if I live life with a closed fist then everything I own 
It's mine. Nobody's going to get any of it. It's mine. Good luck with letting God put something else in that hand. But if I live my life like this, I say, God, you know, I don't know what you want to do, but whatever I have is yours. You use it. Something may be taken out, but you know what's going to happen immediately? Something else is going to be put back in. And I can tell you this, a lot more can be put into an open hand than a closed fist. Do you know why there are some people that are so blessed financially? Do you know why some people, it seems like everything they touch turns to gold? Do you know why some people, it seems like everything they do prospers? Because they live life with an open hand, not a closed fist. And so Jesus said, you need to learn to invest wisely. He said, put treasures in heaven. That's the greatest investment of all. And then finally, and we close with this, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Are you guarding your heart when it comes to worry and seeking the kingdom of God? My challenge today is the same that Jesus made, that what we must learn to do is to seek him, seek his authority, seek his pleasure, seek him first. He's King Jesus. Is he king of your life? Is he king of your private life? Is he king of your thoughts? Oh, I know that you can't help sometimes having a bad thought, but it's kind of like I heard years ago, you may not be able to keep a bird from flying over your head, but you surely can keep it from building a nest in your hair. And when it comes to our thoughts, oftentimes you know what happens, we'll have a thought, and rather than letting it go, we want to just hold on to it. Feels good, but in the end, it's poison. And so I want to challenge you today that you would put Jesus above all, above all. That's a challenge for new believers. That's a challenge for people like me that have been saved for over 40 years. That is a challenge for us all, that we put him first in everything that we do. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to seek your kingdom first to seek you above all else. God, help us to truly not worry, but to trust you. Now, before I finish my prayer, what is God saying to you today? Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I think God spoke to me today about something. Something in the message today spoke to me, and um, I want to pray about that. Would you raise your hand, anybody like that? Something in the message today spoke to you? All right, a lot of people. Heavenly Father, help us to put you first and release what we're holding on to, release what's holding us back. And the final part of my prayer is this, do you need to be saved? We saw five people that had put their trust in Christ get baptized earlier. That's awesome. I wonder today, do you need to do that? Do you need to trust Jesus as Savior? You need to become a follower of Christ. I don't mean join a church. I don't mean be a good person. I'm talking about trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ by faith. And today, if you would like to do that online or in the house today, you can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I believe you did everything necessary to save me. Right now, I'm asking you to come into my life. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'm calling on you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, if you prayed that prayer online, please click the button at the bottom of the screen that you're watching and uh, fill out the next step card as well. That way we can know about your decision to trust Christ and put him first. In the room today, um, I'm going to come back in just a moment. But uh, in the room today, if you wanted to uh, fill out that card and give it to us at the end of the service, we can do that. Uh, At this time, I'm going to invite you to come and give in your miracle offering. Now, let me just address this. Um, Many of you are like Kim and I, you give digitally. I gave our miracle offering last night uh, through the church app, the church center app, I believe it's called. And... um, So maybe you've already done that. 
maybe you've given text to give, maybe you've written a check already or whatever. Um, but what we have prepared is there is a card in the seat back in front of you. And if you've already given online digitally, then obviously uh, we don't expect you to bring up a blank envelope up here. That'd be silly. Uh, but what we would invite you to do is if you have a special uh, big, hairy, audacious goal, big, hairy, audacious prayer request that you're praying that God will answer for you, I want you to put it on here and uh, just drop it in the basket, okay? You can pray up here if you'd like. Now, you don't have to do that. Some of you are going to give digitally. Some of you wrote checks out to bring. If you wrote out a check or cash, you can bring it and put it in one of these baskets. That's why they're here. But I do realize that most people, about 95% of our giving is online or digital now. So uh, if you would like to come and pray, you just fill out this card and drop it in the basket. If you have a check or cash that you want to put in for the miracle offering, you come physically bring that. If you're like Kim and me, you've already given, uh, then you can just fill out this card if you'd like and come and put it in there. Something that you're praying for, okay? Um, I'm going to ask you to stay seated. Um, I'm going to have prayer. And then if you'd like to come pray, or if you'd like to come put an offering in the miracle offering, then you can do that as well. Okay? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just help us today to trust you in all that we do. Help us to put you above all. Bless this offering. Hear and answer prayers that are being prayed as so many are going to pray big goals, big prayers, big prayer requests. I pray that you do it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We're going to take several minutes. If you'd like to come and pray or you'd like to come and put in an offering, you can feel free to do that at this time. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.